Hi there, everybody. So I do realize I'm the last thing between you guys and lunch, so uh, I'm going to try and be as brief as I can. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, building voice UIs using JavaScript. Uh, just a couple of slides on who I am. Um, my name is Memo. That is actually my real name. Um, I am from Mexico, and I love sneakers. So those are three things about me. If you ever want to talk about any of those things, I'm available for that. Um, oh, and I use JavaScript weird. So I don't make web pages. I don't uh, know a lot about client-side JavaScript. Uh, my whole experience with JavaScript is node serverless for voice. Um, when I joined the Alexa team, uh, I really hadn't ever done a JavaScript development. Uh, I came over from a different company that used a different technology stack. Uh, but these three years have been an incredible ride. It's been a lot of fun. Um, I'm really happy that I get to work on the stuff that I get to work. Uh, we like to use this slide to talk about uh, UIs. So voice UIs are um, a big thing for Amazon. We really, truly believe in these. Uh, we think they are going to change how we interact with computers. What we don't believe is that they're here to kill all the other user interfaces. Uh, you might have seen a lot of clickbaity articles at some point talking about that. Uh, that's just someone trying to make a living out of your clicks. Um, so we have all, at some point, used character mode, right? We typed something in there, or we've used a graphical user interface. Most of us do. Web's def web pages definitely changed the game uh, when it came to UIs uh, and mobile development and React, uh, reactive design and all these different things were a big paradigm shift. So we've seen these changes uh, go along. But I like to think about it a little bit more like this, um, where we have multiple UIs. These exist. Uh, but we choose which one we use based on uh, the type of work we're doing. I don't foresee a future where I tell my uh, terminal to navigate to a specific folder and then do npm i minus minus save uh, some package, right? ASK-SDK. Uh, from a language perspective, that is not how I talk. Uh, and also, it is very hard to say and to hear. So um, there's going to be very different user interfaces for very different tasks, and that's OK. Uh, I'm just here to talk a little bit about voice as a user interface. Um, so the first thing I wanted to talk about is how uh, do Alexa skills actually work. So quick show of hands. I think I can see if I cover my eyes. Who's built a voice U UI of any sort? All right, a couple, a couple hands in there. So you guys are old pros. I'm just going to take the rest of us on a, on a quick little ride here uh, about how uh, voice skills on Alexa work. Um, and the way it works is here's a quick 10,000 foot view of it. We got the user on the left side. Uh, we got your code that you would deploy on the right side. In the middle, we got a handy dandy device called uh, an Echo. And I actually have one up here. Uh, and I'm going to do a quick little demo for you. Alexa. Start Cascadia JS. Hi, Cascadia JS. It's almost lunchtime. Yum. <laughs> okay, so that's that was a quick little demo that I put together. And uh, actually, if I tell it to say goodbye right now, it's going to explode. There's going to be an error, and I'm going to try and live code that uh, before uh, lunch. So uh, hopefully, the demo gods are on my side today. Um, so that's just some JavaScript code that I deployed to a Lambda function uh, hosted on AWS. And it's just serverless code all written in uh, uh, JavaScript. I'm actually taking advantage of an NPM package uh, called ASK-SDK, which is the Alexa SDK uh, language. Uh, that's actually written in uh, TypeScript, but we're not going to ding him for that. Um, so how is this actually working? When I said something to the device, how did it actually parse it? Um, I said something, which is very different than typing something. There, a good analogy for it is Ethernet versus Wi-Fi. Uh, if I connect an Ethernet cable to my computer, I know that the data is going from one end of the cable to the other end of the cable. If I'm connected to Wi-Fi, I'm transmitting radio signals all over the room, and they're bouncing around. Uh, that's why the speed on the Wi-Fi at home is so crappy. Um, but voice is the same way. If I say something, it bounces around this room, uh, and then it hits your ears, and then you do some natural language understanding on it, and then you figure out what I meant to say. Um, Alexa works the same way. It's got a 
multiple microphones on it. Um, and when I say four miles, that's a phonetic spe spelling for four miles. You are not uh, too hungry that you're looking, seeing weird signs. It's an upside down uh, omega sign. Um, but that could mean many things. It could mean, for example, four miles. And we, we parse that based on a grammar and a language model that I'm going to show you real quick in a second. And then we turn that into everyone's favorite, JSON. So why use JavaScript to build Alexa skills? Because we turn all that language um, into a JSON object. And there's nothing that's easier to work with uh, than JavaScript and JSON. So it's, it should come very naturally to you. Um, what we do is we turn what the user said, what we call an utterance, into an intent, what the user meant, what was their intention. Uh, and then we pass you a JSON object that has the name of the intent and might have some variables in there uh, so you can process that. So on, in your code, really, all that's happening is that you're taking some JSON, you're parsing it, you're working with it, and then you're returning JSON uh, that just adheres to our standard and we do all the heavy lifting for the voice processing, the natural language understanding, all these different things. We said a couple, oh, and this is uh, a sample of a JSON object that would be sent into our code. Uh, that one, for example, is in Spanish. Uh, so you'll see there's a tag called locale, and it's ES-MX. We're very proud at Amazon to have support for multiple languages. I think we're at 15 uh, right now. And one thing to keep in mind is you might see in the language dropdown when you're building an Alexa skill, there's multiple English models. Um, and people kind of tend to laugh at it when they don't really think through it. Because why do you need an English model for Australia, and an English model for Ireland, and an English model for the US, and an English model for the UK? Uh, beyond the, just the acoustic modeling of how we speak, we call things differently, right? So in the UK, these aren't pants, right? So if I tell someone, like, hey, you want to uh, go with me and I'm going to go pants shopping, it might be an OK thing to do with my friend. But if I say that exact same sentence in the UK, I'm making a different proposition, uh, which is, do you want to come underwear shopping with me? And it have some implications, right? So that's why we need multiple language models. In the Spanish side, um, I don't speak when I'm speaking in Spanish like someone from Spain. Uh, they call shoes that I'm very fond of, uh, zapatillas. That is what we call ballet shoes in Mexico. I would never say that I'm into ballet shoes because I'm just not. I'm just not. Um, so it's, it, it just forks and it grows and grows and grows. So it's really important to have these uh, multiple language models so we can capture input accurately. And the name of the game when it comes to voice is accuracy and context. Um, so this is describing the first flow at the top. There's a bunch of different really complicated math and compute, compute that's happening in there. The good news is you don't need to do it. It's a, it's a bit of a black box, but it's a toolbox for you that we already built, completely free to use. What we use is speech recognition, so we're trying to turn uh, the, the audio that we got into text, then use uh, machine learning and natural language understanding to um, understand the meaning of that text. <clears throat> so if you said blue, do you mean the color blue, blue or the uh, verb blue? Um, and it kind of balloons out of there. On the right side, there's just some JavaScript code, and it's all just working with JSON. Um, on the flip side, so if you're going on the, from the back, we're returning a response, and we're saying the output speech is OK, um, and the type is SSML. And we're get, we'll get to SSML in a second. SSML stands for Speech Synthesis Markup Language. Uh, you can think of it almost like CSS for voice. So when you heard Alexa say yum, uh, it put a bunch of emphasis into that. Uh, I'm using SSML to mark up my speech when I'm returning it to, uh, to our ears, basically. So what it's doing here is going to take that um, object, find what the actual output speech is, and then it'll say it. And again, that's a phonetic spelling for OK. Um, and that's what we'll hear, and then hopefully we'll try to, our, our human brain will parse it properly. Uh, so, just final reminder of last time we'll see this guy, um, and it's um, that everything that's happening at our, uh, communicating with our uh, service is JSON, and all our code is JavaScript. It's hosted on AWS for, in my case, uh, using serverless technology, which is Lambda, but you could build an HTTPS server, or if you already have an HTTPS server, uh, and just direct the traffic there, do all your processing there, send it back. Um, there's no real 
language requirement. We just love JavaScript, uh, and we've built this amazing SDK, but we also have a bunch of samples out there and uh, all this documentation specifically for uh, JavaScript. So it should be very easy for you guys uh, and gals to get started uh, today. Um, so I'm not going to bore you too much with that. I just want to talk a little bit about how you build one of these. Uh, and like any other piece of software, it's going to have a user interface and a programming logic. So a front end and a back end, uh, except the front end is like ear end uh, and voice end. Right, because what you're saying, what you're hearing, and the programming logic is just going to be some code. Um, in the specific demo that I'm going to do, I'm going to build all my uh, voice UI using developer.amazon.com, and then I'm going to post my logic in AWS. Um, quick, quick, quick reminder. What we're going to be doing when we're building a voice UI, and I'm going to show you one that's pre-made, uh, is we're going to take utterances, the different ways uh, someone speaks and then map those to an intent. The intent is just a flag that I, then I can look at in my code and say, based on this event, I want to run this code. Um, but it's, what we're doing is we're training a system. We're using artificial intelligence, ML, uh, uh, natural language understanding. So uh, I put a bunch of utterances into a funnel, and those get turned into an intent. Uh, and then in my code, I'm going to actually handle those. Um, and I'll go walk line by line through this code in a second. Um, but you got to remember, most important thing probably out of this whole uh, talk is garbage in, garbage out. So you're training a model. If you put in a bunch of useless training data, it's going to behave wildly and erratically and do all these things that you don't actually want it to do. Uh, so you got to be really mindful of what you're training your model to do. Uh, when you're training the model, you're not building, you're not creating an array or an enumeration of uh, sentences that the user can say. You're giving an array in, or an enumeration of sentences to a machine, and it's going to try to build a grammar and a language model out of that. Uh, so be really careful about what you're, what you're doing. If all your sentences end in the word please, what you're teaching the model is to look for sentences that end in the word please. So variety, looking for different adjectives, different verbs, uh, talking in plural versus singular. That one I learned from my mom because she kept breaking my skills. Um, so I'm going to do a quick demo. Um, and I'm going to show you what I built uh, to do that really, really basic um, skill that I showed you. And of course, I'm logged out, but easy fix. Um, OK, so what I did is I created an intent that was call, called begin intent in a skill called Cascadia JS. Um, I actually ran into an issue, because Cascadia JS is hard to say. It's a made up word. So I had to split it up into Cascadia, which I didn't have any issues capturing. And then JS, I did it two ways. JS as two letters, and then JS as an initialism, which is J period S period. FBI is an initialism. It's not really an acronym. An acronym is when you can say the word uh, out loud. And of course, I'm blanking out right now. I'll yeah, NASA, NASA is a good one. Thank you. Um, so uh, in this case, I did it both ways. Um, this should be just, but uh, it still works. And uh, what I did is I created these utterances for this uh, utterance, and they're all get started, let's get started, to start, begin my talk, start my talk. They all have this, um, they're conveying the message of I want to get going. Um, and I could add a ton more vari variety here. What you have to be mindful of if, is if you have multiple intents, you have to think of them as a Venn diagram. They shouldn't overlap. When you're making a website or an, or, or, uh, an app, you would never put two buttons that kind of overlap, and then the user clicks on it, and you're like, I don't know what's going to happen. Exciting. Um, <laughs> it's the same thing for voice. If you put the same utterance in two intents, you're going to confuse the model. It's not going to really know what to do. Uh, so it's going to behave erratically. I also made a goodbye intent. Uh, and I have bye-bye, goodbye, say goodbye, say bye in there. Uh, let me demo that real quick, and it'll just be an error, because I haven't created the code to handle it. Uh, and we're going to do that right now. Alexa, tell Cascadia JS to say goodbye. Sorry, an error occurred. So that's just my, my back-end code saying, like, I don't know how to handle this. I got an, an intent, and I don't know what Sorry, to do with it. Sorry, an error occurred. <laughs> Alexa, stop. 
goodbye. <laughs> so it's, it, just, it would have been just cycle there with that error. Um, so what I'm going to do is go to my AWS console. And all I have here is just a Lambda function that has a trigger uh, set up for Alexa skills kit and has a dependency on the SDK. So let me show you that real quick. Um, designer. So this is just the AWS, AWS Lambda console. Here I'm saying it, it can take Alexa skills kit events to trigger my code. Uh, since it's serverless, it doesn't mean it doesn't use a server. It just means that me as a lazy developer, I don't have to think about the server. I don't care if it's a Windows box or a Linux box or if someone hardened it or if there's a load balancer in front of it. It just does all that magically for me, which is great because I don't want to spend my time doing that. Um, and then looking at my code really quickly, you'll notice that uh, I have a few handlers. I have a begin handler. I have a help handler, uh, and I have an error handler. And that's where it was saying, sorry, an error occurred. But I don't have a handler for the other intent that I created, which is the, let me refresh this page to make sure that my changes will actually do something. Um, I don't have a handler for the goodbye intent. So it, that's why just throwing an error. Um, I'm going to create that intent real quickly. And what we have here is I'm just going to steal my own code and turn this begin handler into a goodbye handler. By intent handler. And what I'm doing is uh, this handler has two uh, uh, functions in it. One is can handle and the other one is handle. They both take a handler input as a parameter and that parameter contains a whole request that we were sent uh, from the Alexa uh, service and uh, all I have to do is return true to the event that I want to respond to. So uh, I'm saying request type intent request and then uh, instead of begin intent I'm going to change it to be goodbye intent and I've known from doing a lot of live demos that you should never type, copy and paste as your friend. And then the response here, instead of being, hi, Cascadia JS, uh, blah, 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 I'm going to just say, enjoy your lunch. Um, and then punctuation, spelling, all those things really matter here. Because if I screw it up, it's going to say, or uh, if I forget that my, I'm sending a response back that is supposed to be in Spanish and I type it in English, it's going to try to parse all those letters as Spanish and it'll be Spanglish and it'll be uh, hilarious but not very helpful. Um, so now I'm just going to save that. And since all deployed to the cloud, I can just immediately test it. Alexa, tell Cascadia JS to say goodbye. Sorry, an error <laughs> occurred. So, <laughs> this is where you pull your parachute Sorry, out. Sorry, an error occurred. Alexa, stop. Um, and I'm Sorry, just gonna... an error occurred. <laughs> so apparently it broke everything. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, just show you from the simulator, and we can do a quick debug. Cascadia J S. So this is the simulator. It allows us to type in things that we could also say, uh, and of course, Nothing is working now. This is no one's fault but myself. Um, that was a comma. OK, here we go. So once we see this in the simulator, we have the JSON object that's going into my service on the left and uh, the response on the right. And you'll see that here's the one, since I just said, open, it's giving me that welcome message, but if I say uh, open Cascadia JS and say goodbye, we should get an error that we can debug with. So I have this event, and I can take this whole event, go back to my Lambda function, and configure a test event. Here, um, I'm going to create a new event, going to call it error, and then I'm going to replace it there. And I'm, I'm going to pass in this error, this event, into my Lambda function bypassing the Alexa service. So I'm kind of spoofing it. But since it's my own account, uh, it's secure, and I can actually do that. 
Um, then I'm going to click test. And I think I already know my error, which is my, the error that I always make, which is handler chain not found. Yep. Handler chain not found. So what I did is I created the handler, but I never registered it. So it doesn't know there's a handler for it. So um, go, I'm going to register that handler. This is what happens when you live code. Um, copy that handler. And then down here at the bottom, with the actual SDK, I will just register that. I'm going to save and test. And now we should just see that. Enjoy your lunch message. So it works. Uh, I'm going to wait, wait a second for Alexa to come back, because I unplugged her, because she was looped. Uh, and we'll test that. Uh, in the meantime, now that we've done with our demo and got four minutes, I just wanted to leave you with some design notes about voice. Um, so a few thoughts on design. The first one is friction is the enemy. Uh, anytime I'm doing anything with voice, I'm probably like that awesome lady just hanging out on a hammock by a cactus reading a book. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but what I don't want to do is get up and touch something or find my phone or whatever. Like, I just want to be able to say things. So if it doesn't pass the couch test, uh, it's, not good. it's not probably a good use case for voice. Uh, we also don't talk the way we write. Uh, just ask your English teacher from uh, 12th grade. So anytime you type in something that the user needs to say or that Alexa is going to reply, just say it out loud. You'll be surprised at how good we're at tongue twisters. But you read them, and you're like, that makes perfect sense. I'm an incredible writer. Where's my, uh, where's my Oscar? Um, the other one is follow the, the one breath rule. If you're sending some response back uh, and it takes longer than a breath to read out, it's too much information. Voice has a problem, or a, it's not a problem. It's just a characteristic, which is, it, require, it has a high cognitive load. And what that means is we have to pay attention to what the device is saying. We can't multitask with voice. Uh, you can pretend that you're watching a movie and also listening to a conversation, but you're quickly context switching, and you're probably getting 70% of one and 30% of the other. So if we're giving the user options and they're only getting 30% of it, it's going to be bad. So be brief, uh, and don't talk at people. Talk to people. You always want to model something. Uh, as a real conversation between uh, humans. Variety is your friend. So every time you call your bank or your airline, you get the exact same prompts in the exact same monotone voice that is incredibly boring. That's also not how we talk with humans. So add some, add some spice in there. Use SSML. Say yum when you're uh, ending your message. It makes it stickier. It makes it memorable. If it's Monday, say happy Monday. Or if it's Thursday, say, it's almost Friday. I don't know. Just make it a little bit more interesting. Design for the situation. You can break down any step in a conversation into four things. The utterance, so what the user said, what the situation they're in. Is this the first time I've ever seen them? Is this the 100th time they saw, I saw them? Were they in the middle of the game last time they talked to me? And then what response am I going to send them? And what prompt or what question am I going to ask them? You can break down every single interaction into this. And then you can make awesome little cards with those and start storyboarding with them. Diagrams uh, or flow charts are not a good way to design a voice conversation because the user can say anything whenever they want. If I call a travel agent I can, and they ask me, where do you want to go? I can say, I want to go tomorrow. And they're not going to hang up on me and be like, nope, wrong answer. <laughs> So your skill should work the same way. It should be really, really freeing. Again, friction is the enemy. Um, that is it for me. Uh, I just want to let Alexa say goodbye. Alexa, tell Cascadia JS to say goodbye. Sorry, I'm not sure Damn about it. that. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was an absolute pleasure. All right, bear with us for just one or two minutes while we uh, do a little laptop switch. I know, oh, by the way, while I have your attention for a couple, a couple moments, um, I'll just go ahead and admit that I can ask more specific and better questions when trying to plan lunches. Um, that is a, a betterment that we can do for next year. Um, I would, uh, I do want to say though, uh, if you did not specifically specify a dietary restriction of vegetarian or vegan, uh, please abstain from those items when you go grab lunch. I know they're all delicious, um, but planning's tough, 
and we just want to make sure that there are enough vegetarian and vegan options for the people who need them. Um, but uh, here we are, uh, and I wanted to take uh, a couple minutes to talk about the closing party uh, that we're having tonight. And uh, the best person to kind of share this event with you is Heidi Larson, uh, one of the co-organizers of Cascadia, and more or less the brainchild of uh, the event we have tonight. So I'm going to turn it over to Heidi. Hello. <laughs> Hey, I'm really excited to hang out with you all at the Living Computer Museum tonight. And if you're not excited yet, um, let me tell you a little bit more about it because the name doesn't communicate a lot. Um, it's a computer museum because it has the largest collection of mainframes, um, super macro mini computers in the world. And it's living because they all work and you can use them. So if you're not excited yet, um, that's just upstairs. Downstairs is all the modern tech, so interactive exhibits with AI, VR, big data, there's a self-driving car, there's digital art, there's video game making, I'm forgetting stuff. Anyway, it's gonna be really great. Please come to the Living Computer Museum and have fun with us. Starts at 6.30, um, there's gonna be food and drink there, have, well, snacks and, um, and then beverages there, and there will be a food truck outside for anyone who wants to come directly from this event. Um, you need your badge to get in, you need your ID to drink, and yeah, and then we'll just get to play. There's karaoke as well. Yeah, if I forget anything, Carter will cover it. Okay, awesome, thank you so much, Heidi. She's worked really hard, give her a round of applause. Um, yeah, this event is absolutely gonna be amazing. Uh, I've told you a little bit about the logistics, I've sent you an email about the logistics, uh, I asked you to RSVP so we could get a head count. Uh, a couple logistical items. One, I think we are absolutely cool for people to bring plus ones. So up to, you know, we're not gonna turn anybody away from the Living Computers Museum. So please come, please consider bringing a spouse, a friend. Uh, we just wanna share the experience with everybody. Uh, as Heidi mentioned briefly, uh, please eat dinner before you come. Um, there will be food there, but more snack style, charcuterie stuff. Um, we have, we, there will be a food truck parked in the parking lot right outside the museum. Um, it's not free, you'll have to pay for it, um, but the, it's not very expensive and the food is super yummy. I wanted to take a minute, um, you, you, for those of you who joined me at the opening party last night, you know, you've heard this and I'll just say it again, like these events, you know, doing buyouts, like reserving these wonderful, amazing spaces exclusively for our use so that we can all be together, enjoy each other's company and kind of feel like our people are here. It's incredibly uh, expensive. Uh, and I just wanna thank uh, these four companies for making tonight's event possible. Twilio, Misty Robotics, Microsoft Edge, and Esri. So could you please give them all a round of applause? All right, and wait, one, one last thing. Do you all wanna do a little live demo? A little live demo? It'll take two seconds. Take out your phone right now. If you, if you know at the company I used to work for, this is not surprising you at all. Let's test the Carter's Karaoke Hotline. Please text your name, your song, and your artist to 206-203-8811. Go ahead and do it now. I'm actually gonna go ahead and play along. And let's see, luckily I already prepped something. Let's see if it works. This is of course where demos fail. Uh, oh man, oh, ooh, nice, Rasputin, I don't know that. So, so these, are gonna, these are gonna start to stream in, awesome. So this is what's gonna happen tonight. And, but the thing is, the DJ, we, we have got the best karaoke DJ I've ever seen. Um, this, Ivan is amazing, but Ivan is cruel. So Ivan will see things like, I'm on a boat, and he'll click cancel. And you'll get, a, you'll get a text message saying, sorry, Ivan doesn't like your song. Um, on the flip side, you know, Ivan will look around and he'll say, he'll see, oh, fireworks by Katy Perry, call it up. And we'll, you'll, we'll go ahead and click that button and we'll call up your song. So this is the experience that we're gonna, we're gonna have tonight. Um, I, I love karaoke, I know a lot of you do too. Uh, okay, th th thank you for bearing with me. I can't wait to see all of you tonight. Now go have lunch.